Stanford University. So we are very, very grateful that uh, Secretary Schultz was able to make today's presentation possible. And with this, I, I welcome Secretary Schultz. I enjoy a little cocktail at night. So probably some of you do too. But what, what do you want? Well, you want something that goes down nicely, smooth. Then, of course, there's a little excitement that comes with it. That's a good cocktail. But then there's a very unusual type that I haven't been able to find yet. But at the end, it says to you, sober up, pal. This is serious. Now, what does it take to get that kind of a cocktail? Well, first of all, high intelligence. If you don't have that, you're not going anywhere. But that's not enough. You need keen powers of observation. That is, the ability to really see what's there with its nuances and change. And not only see, but hear, listen. Most people think you learn by talking. No, you learn by listening. And listening carefully. And again, getting the nuances, saying to say, what is this guy trying to tell me? Figuring it out deeply. And then you need to add to that cocktail a lot of energy. So you get around. You're not just in one place. You're here, there, and elsewhere. That gives you perspective, contrast. So you put all these things together, and that's still not enough. Because somehow you have to be able to put it across. You have to be able to express yourself with some clarity and be able to get to the essence of something without having people stand around for hours to, before you get around to it. So you put all this together and you've got something very special. Of course, I'm talking about Tom Friedman. He's going to, we have the great privilege of having him address us today. He has given us so much from books going from Beirut to Jerusalem to hot, hot, hot flat and crowded with a stop in between for a phrase that has grabbed everybody, the world is flat. And then his twice a week columns in the New York Times, I don't see how you think up twice a week something to say. It's <laughs> remarkable, but it happens week after week after week. It's fantastic. So it's a great privilege for me to introduce to you my friend Tom Friedman. Well, it's great to be back at Stanford, great to be with all of you here. Um, most of all, for me, it's, it's a treat to be able to do a favor and good deed um, for my friend uh, George Schultz and his wife Charlotte, who are dear friends and teachers uh, of mine. And I think you're so lucky to have uh, someone uh, with his wisdom, that's really the right word, uh, on this campus. And I know how privileged I am to have him as a friend. So thank you, George. Um, I'm going to uh, talk today about the updated version of Hot, Flat, and Crowded. I know s some of you have read it. Those of you who haven't, I know who you are. I uh, <laughs> know where you go to school. I know where you hang out. Um, now, you, you look at this book. It has a green cover. You know, it's a Bosch painting, uh, lots of green uh, environmental stuff. And it's actually not about green, I have to confess. Uh, and really what I want to talk about, uh, in many ways, is what this book is, is really about. Uh, this book is actually about America. What prompted this book is really my concern about my country uh, and my fear that we are losing our groove and how we get our groove back. Now, people often ask me about my politics. They say, well, I, you know, I can't quite, are you a Republican, a Democrat, are you a liberal, a conservative, and I say, well, actually, I just believe in three things. 
It's really not very complicated. Uh, first thing I believe is that something Warren Buffett said, that 95% of what I've been able to get in life was actually because I was born in this country at this time with these institutions and these opportunities. And it's the first obligation of our generation to pass on this country with these institutions and these opportunities to our kids. That's the first thing I believe. Second thing I believe is 95% of the joy I get out of life is living in a world rich with clean air and clean oceans, flora, fauna, species, and biodiversity. And our second obligation is to pass on this planet that we've enjoyed in the same condition uh, to our kids. Third thing I believe is that a lot of bad things happen in the world without America, but not a lot of good things at scale. Not a lot of good things at scale. Not a lot of Marshall Plans, not a lot of Montreal Protocols that, that George worked on, not a lot of victories in World War II. And if we go weak as a country, if we go into incremental decline, you won't just live in a different country. You will live in a different world. And so that's really what's on my mind and really where this book emerged. Now when I tell people that I think we've lost our groove, I always like to start with, sorry, um, up, 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 not. So whenever I say I think we've lost our groove, I like to start with this billboard that appeared in South Africa two years ago for the Daimler Smart 44 car. For those of you in the back who can't read it, it said German engineering, Swiss innovation, American nothing. It's a real billboard. Someone actually thought that the best way to sell their product to a foreign audience was to advertise that it had American nothing inside. That billboard pisses me off. Because I actually think, from my own travels, our country's still exploding with engineering and innovative prowess as good as Switzerland or Germany. But somehow, somehow we're not getting the most out of it. If I were to draw a picture of America today, it would actually be a picture of the space shuttle taking off. All this incredible thrust coming from below, all these innovators and entrepreneurs, I travel all over the country, I meet them everywhere I go, energy innovators. They come up to me, Mr. Friedman, I've got an idea, I've got a duck, it paddles a wheel, blows up a balloon, issues methane, turns a turbine, I hear the craziest stuff. But it tells me our country is exploding with innovation. I go to small towns, speak at universities, I come back to my hotel room after, I empty my pocket of business cards from energy and environmental innovators. Rock stars get room keys, I get business cards, but they're very exciting in their own way. And they tell me our country's alive, exploding with innovative prowess, just like the space shuttle. All that thrust from below. Unfortunately, though, our booster rocket, government, Washington, D.C., is cracked and leaking energy. And the pilots in the cockpit are fighting over the flight plan. And so right now, our country cannot achieve escape velocity the escape velocity it needs to get into the next orbit. What's ailing us? Well, I could spend afternoon talking about that, but I want to talk about what I think is the most important issue ailing us right now, and that is a values breakdown. I think what we've had in the last three or four years is the culmination of a values breakdown in both the market and Mother Nature. We moved from sustainable values to situational values. Oh, we've always had a combination of both, but something happened in the last decade where we tipped. Now, you heard me right. In both the market and Mother Nature, I believe when historians look back at 2007, 2008, at what we call the Great Recession, they're actually going to say this was a moment when both the market and Mother Nature hit the wall at the same time. This was actually the moment when both the market and Mother Nature said, this is your warning heart attack. You are growing in an unsustainable way in the market and Mother Nature. 
Turn back now. How were we growing? Well, in the very simplest terms, what we were doing was basically opening more and more stores to sell more and more stuff, to be made in more and more Chinese factories powered by more and more coal, to earn China more and more dollars, to buy more and more T-bills, to be recirculated back to America to build more and more stores, to sell more and more stuff, to be made in more and more Chinese factories powered by more and more coal, to earn them more and more T-bills, to be recirculated back to America to build more. I could do this all afternoon. That was the loop basically we were in. And I would argue that in 2007, 2008, that loop is what blew up. And the reason that both the market and Mother Nature actually blew up at the same time was because they were both based on the exact same accounting principles. And that's why it is no accident that Citibank, Iceland's banks, and the ice banks of Antarctica all melted at the same time. And that's why it is no accident that Bear Stern and the polar bear both faced extinction at the same time. Because they were both based on the same accounting, underpricing risk, privatizing gains, and socializing losses. In both the market and Mother Nature, we were practicing the exact same accounting. In the market, we allowed investment banks to massively underprice the risk of subprime mortgages. We allowed the brokers and mortgage dealers and investment banks and banks who did that to privatize the gains. And then when it all blew up in 2007, we socialized all the losses on the back of every American taxpayer. We do the exact same thing in nature. The same accounting. We allow people to massively underprice the risk of emitting carbon molecules. We allow the people who do that, all of us, cheap gas, cheap coal, to privatize the gains. And we are now socializing the losses in the form of carbon molecules in the atmosphere that we're charging on our children's visa cards that they will pay for in the future in the form of disruptive climate change. In both the market and mother nature, we are practicing the exact same accounting. Now, underneath these accounting rules are the same two principles, IBG and YBG. I'll be gone or you'll be gone. I issue you a subprime mortgage even though you make only $15,000 a year and you're buying a $750,000 house, no problem, I'll be gone. I bundle your subprime mortgages into 100 of them, turn it into a bond and sell it to a bank in Dusseldorf, no problem, I'll be gone. You can't pay your subprime mortgage no problem, walk away, you'll be gone. We basically have been treating both the market and Mother Nature with the same principles, I'll be gone or you'll be gone. What, what are those principles? What's underlying that? Well, my, one of my teachers and friend, Dove Seidman, likes to, likes to distinguish between what he calls sustainable values and situational values. Situational values say, I'll do whatever the situation allows. If the situation allows me to sell you a subprime mortgage, even though the only, only identification I've even asked of you is, can you fog up a knife, then I'll do it. Sustainable values would tell me I never should. Situationally, I can now plow up 100 acres of the Amazon and, and plant soybeans, to sell to China, situationally I can do that, sustainable values would tell me I shouldn't. We've had a massive shift in this country, I would argue, from sustainable values to situational values. You know, the greatest generation built us an incredible world of freedom and abundance based on a lot more sustainable values than situational ones. Our generation, we've done amazing things. We've, women's rights and civil rights, we ended the Vietnam War, made huge discoveries, dot-coms, but we've also been the grasshopper generation. We ate through all that abundance like hungry locusts. Now we and our kids need to be the regeneration and basically regenerate what has been left to us now. Now how do we do that? And this is the end of the introduction. If we don't bring sustainable values 
to the market and Mother Nature, we are going to be more unfree than had the greatest generation not won the Cold War. That is our job. What freedom was for the greatest generation, sustainability needs to be for the regeneration. And I'm not just talking about in nature, I'm talking about in the market as well. Why is that? As my, one of my teachers, Rob Watson, the founder of Lead Buildings, likes to say, Mother Nature and the market are the two most autistic forces on the planet. Autistic in the sense of feeling no emotion. Mother Nature, she's just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't sweet talk her. You can't talk her up. You can't talk her down. You can't say, Mother Nature, we're having a bad recession. Could you give us a break this year? No 113 degree temperatures in Los Angeles. Give us a break. No, Mother Nature, she's going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate, and she always bats last, and she always bats a thousand. Do not mess with Mother Nature. The market, same thing. The market is just a balance between greed and fear, greed and fear, greed and fear, greed and fear at any millisecond around a stock, a bond, a commodity, a piece of real estate. It's going to do whatever the balance of greed and fear dictate. Do not mess with the market. It is an autistic force that will show you no sympathy. The only way we can moderate these two huge forces shaping our lives is by bringing sustainable values to them, not situational ones. If we continue to behave situationally in this integrated world we have in the market and Mother Nature, they're together going to eat us alive. And that's why the role of the regeneration is to bring sustainable values to our markets, Mother Nature, and political life the way the greatest generation fought, defended, and expanded freedom. How do we do that? What is the project? And that really gets to the argument of, of this book. I believe one way we do that is by setting an example. People respond to examples. And I think the most important way we get our groove back as a country is by taking on the biggest problem on the planet. And what I want to argue for the rest of this talk is that is the problem of a planet getting hot, flat, and crowded. Now, what's this hot, flat, and crowded all about? Well, hot obviously refers to global warming, the fact that global average temperatures have risen almost one degree centigrade, a degree and a half Fahrenheit, since the uh, Industrial Revolution. I know what you're thinking, or audiences less informed than this, I say, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you mean, all that Al Gore stuff is about one degree centigrade? That's right, it is, because as the scientists have taught us, small changes in global average temperature have huge climate effects. Remember that the difference between the world in an ice age and the world in a warming period is just six degrees centigrade average temperature. So one degree has a huge effect. Crowded? Well, here's crowded. In 1830, there were one billion human beings on the planet. In 2008, there were a billion teenagers. We're going from a world of 6.7 billion people to 9.2 billion people by the year 2050. That's crowded. But that's not the only problem. There's another problem. Don't let it out of this room. There are too many Americans in the world today. Oh, I'm being facetious. Of course, it's a blessing that so many people in India and China, Russia and Brazil can live like Americans, live in American-sized homes, drive American-sized cars on American-sized roads, eating American-sized Big Macs. It's a blessing. There's just one problem. The good Lord did not design this planet for this many Americans. It's not just that we're going from 6.7 to 9.2 billion people. The important number is how many of them are, in consumption terms, Americans. And therefore, unless we, the original Americans, redefine in more sustainable terms what it means to live an American lifestyle and invent the technologies so more people can do that, 
we're going to burn up, choke up, heat up, smoke up, and eat up this planet with this many Americans, even more than Al Gore predicts. And that's really what flat is all about. In a flat world, more people can see how we live, aspire to how we live, and live like we live. My simple argument in this book is that hot, flat, and crowded, these three trends, all converged to a tipping point right around the year 2000. And when they did, they created a huge fire. And this fire is now driving five global, I'll call them megatrends. And these trends and how we rise to meet them or don't, I believe is going to determine the stability or instability of our planet in the 21st century. So let me go through them quickly. The first is energy and natural resources, supply and demand. That's demand for food and fuel, water and timber, fish and clean air, cement and steel, all of which are going through the roof in a hot, flat, and crowded world. Now, there's a lot of ways I can illustrate this to you. One of my favorites is from one of my uh, real helpers on the book, Dave Douglas, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Sun Microsystems. Dave's a computer geek, and he's always sending me stuff when I'm working on the book. And one day he sent me, he said he was noodling around his, on his computer and thinking about this many more Americans, and he said, you know, we're actually going to add a billion people between now and roughly 2020. So Dave said, what if we gave each one of the next billion just one thing? 160 watt incandescent light bulb. I mean, everyone should have their own light bulb, right? So here's what would happen, Dave said. Each bulb doesn't weigh much, roughly 0.7 ounces with the packaging, but a billion of them together weigh around 20,000 metric tons, or about the same as 15,000 Toyota Priuses. Now let's turn them on. If they're all on at the same time, it'd be 60,000 megawatts. Luckily, the next billion will only use their bulbs four hours a day, so we're down to 10,000 megawatts at any moment. Yikes, said Dave. Looks like we'll need 20 new 500 megawatt coal burning power plants just so the next billion people can do one thing, turn on a 60 watt bulb four hours a day. Friends, that's what happens when flat meets crowded. And that is the vector that we're going through now. So I get to travel a lot, and um, two cities I uh, visit regularly, um, but hadn't visited um, before I was working on the book for, for five or so years. First was Doha, Qatar. Qatar is the capital of, uh, Doha is the capital of Qatar, a tiny peninsular state off the east coast of Saudi Arabia. It's where our Middle East headquarters, military headquarters located. I said I've been a frequent visitor there. Hadn't been there for three years before I came while I was writing the book. Landed in downtown Doha in the late afternoon. Friends met me, drove me into the center city. I looked around, and I said, that, 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 that's Manhattan. You, you sprouted Manhattan since the last time I was here. A skyline of glass and steel skyscrapers, all lit up at night, just like ours, all air-conditioned 24-7, just like ours, had exploded from the desert floor like wildflowers after a flash flood. It wasn't there three years earlier. Went on to Iraq, came home, kissed my wife, changed clothes, went off to Dalian, China. I have been spent a lot of time in Dalian because it was the outsourcing capital of China, and I worked on the world as flat there. Hadn't been there for three years. They already had a Manhattan. They sprouted another in the three years since I had been there. I came home. I told my wife, honey, it's so great that we and all the neighbors um, uh, have gotten um, uh, hybrid cars. Dohan Dalian, two cities you've never heard of, ate that for breakfast. Oh, sweetheart, it's wonderful that we've changed all the building codes here in Montgomery County to make our buildings more efficient. Dohan Dalian had that for lunch. I'm thrilled that the Stanford campus has changed all its light bulbs from incandescents to CFLs. Dohan Dalian to cities you've never heard of will snack on that before dinner like so much popcorn. That's what's going on out there when flat meets crowded. This is a huge scale problem. Second meta problem is what I call petro dictatorship. This is the geopolitics of our energy use in a hot, flat, and crowded world. Now, I started this on the back of an envelope one day. Um, basically, what I did was, I call this the first law of petro politics. 
I graphed the average price of OPEC oil from 1979 to 2006. That's the thick black line at the bottom. And if you graph the average price of OPEC oil from 79 to 2006, it looks roughly like that V. Roughly $80 in real dollars in 79, gets down to $16 in 1995. Actually gets down to $10 roughly in 1991. 1991, 1991, 19, what happened in 1991? Oh, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the world's second largest oil producer. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? Never mind, we'll talk about that later. Goes back up to $80 in 2005. And then just for the heck of it, on a hunch, I went to the Fraser Institute in Australia and Freedom House, and I got their freedom indexes for four countries. They do freedom indexes. They measure free and fair elections held, newspaper magazines opened or closed, women's groups, NGOs started, um, and elections held, and they call it their Freedom Index, and I got their Freedom Index for four countries, four, I call them petrol estates, states totally dependent on oil for their GDP. And just for the heck of it, I overlaid the Freedom Index, that's the light gray line at the top, on the average price of oil. I actually do four countries specifically in the book, this is just a composite, I do Nigeria, Iran, Venezuela, and Russia. And darn if it doesn't look something like that. Well, isn't that interesting? As the price of oil goes down, the pace of freedom in these countries go up. And as the price of oil goes up, the pace of freedom goes down. I call that the first law of petropolitics. The price of oil and the pace of freedom in petrol estates moves in opposite directions. Now, actually, you don't need my graph to know this. You just need to read the morning paper. About eight years ago, our then President George W. Bush met with Russia's President Vladimir Putin for the first time, looked in his soul, and reported back that he saw a good man down there. Oil at the time was exactly $35 a barrel. I've looked it up. If you look into Putin's soul today, you will see Gazprom, Lukos, Izvestia, Pravda, and lately Georgia, all of which he swallowed courtesy of $100 a barrel oil which was the first Arab Gulf state to discover oil? Bahrain, tiny island state next to Qatar in the Persian Gulf. Which was the first Arab Gulf state to start to run out of oil? Bahrain. Which was the first Arab Gulf state to hold a free and fair election where women could run and vote? Bahrain. Which was the first Arab Gulf state to sign a free trade agreement with the United States? Bahrain. Which was the first Arab Gulf state to hire McKinsey to overhaul their labor laws because people were going to have to work? Say it with me now, Bahrain, okay? Friends, that is not an accident, any more than it's an accident that the one Arab state that never had a drop of oil, a country near and dear to my heart, Lebanon, is the one that has been a democracy from its very beginning. The price of oil and the pace of freedom move in opposite directions in petrol estates. Please remember that every time you fill up your gas tank. The third Maggie issue is climate change. You know, I don't want to waste a lot of time on this with this group. I normally have to walk through it. I'll just tell you how I've been talking about this issue um, in the last year where we've been bombarded by climate denialism. Um, and there's really two points I like to make. Um, one is I never use the word or term, excuse me, global warming. Global warming sounds so cuddly. Global warming, that sounds, to a kid from Minnesota, that sounds like golf in February, you know. <laughs> no, I, I like to use the term Hunter Lovins from the Rocky Mountain Institute coined, I like to use the term global weirding. Because that's actually what climate change represents. And we've seen that in America this past year. What actually happens through climate change in the process of global warming is the weather gets weird. The hots get hotter. 113 degrees in Los Angeles, the wets get wetter, the dries get drier. The most violent storms are predicted to become more numerous and more serious. That's how we have to explain it to people. This is not some cuddly phenomena called global warming. Second thing I try to do with audiences, tell them when it comes to climate change, I am a Dick Cheney guy. Me and Dick, we're like that, okay? Why is that? Because as you'll recall, Dick Cheney said if there is just a 1% chance, a 1% chance that Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons, it would be catastrophic and irreversible, and therefore responsible preventive diplomacy says you have to take out that threat. Me and Dick, we are like that. 
Because I look at climate change the exact same way. If there is a 1% chance that climate change is real, it would be catastrophic and disruptive to the nth degree. And whenever I see something that is catastrophic, okay, and excuse me, and irreversible, I buy insurance just like Dick. All that this is about is buying insurance. We can't predict what or when is going to happen, but we can and do know this. There is more than 1% chance that climate change will be disruptive, catastrophic, and irreversible. So be like Dick, buy insurance. Okay? The fourth mega trend, oh, I love this photo. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. But the first one was Glacier, Shepherd Glacier in Nash, Glacier National Park in 1930, and this is Shepherd Glacier in National, Glacier National Park in 2005, quite a before and after. This is summer nighttime temperatures. I really like this one. Um, this is uh, the records. 2010 was the hottest average summer night temperature on record in every one of these cities with a red dot. But they said, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to move to the third, fourth megatrend, which is 1.6 billion. I'm told this is actually good news. It's down to 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion are the number of people on this planet who have no regular connection to an electric grid. I call them the energy poor. And energy poverty is a tragic problem in a world that's hot, flat, and crowded. Because if you do not have electricity, if you do not have an on-off switch in your life, you will not have the electricity to uh, dig a deeper well when the dries get drier. You will not have the electricity to run the simplest fan when the hots get hotter. And most of all, your kids will not have the electricity to get to Google and if they can't get to Google, they can't get to all the world's libraries, all the world's books, all the world's latest research, they will fall behind, not at a normal rate, but at an exponential rate. Energy poverty is a huge affliction on the planet today. There are 1.4 billion people at least who have no on-off switch in their life. If you want to know what energy poverty looks like, it looks like this. These are students in the airport parking lot in Guinea doing their homework. I got this slide from my friend Andy Revkin. Is Andy here? Is he? Oh, there he is. Sorry. And um, uh, why are they doing their homework in the airport parking lot in Guinea? Because it was the only place they had light. That's the face of energy poverty. The last megatrend, the one that gets the least amount of attention, but the one that's actually the most important to me, is biodiversity loss. We are in the midst of a mass phase of biodiversity extinction equivalent in scale to when the asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs. Only this time, we are the asteroid. According to Conservation International, we're losing one new species every 20 minutes. We are in a mass phase of biodiversity extinction. It gets almost tragically no attention. I actually call this chapter in my book The Age of Noah because I believe we are actually, in the age of Noah, we are the first generation of human beings who will actually have to think like the biblical Noah and save the last two. I build a chapter around two giant soft-shell turtles, the last two. They're in two different Chinese zoos. One's a male, one's a female, one's 80 years old, the other's 100 years old, and they've been trying to get them to mate. Not so easy. But that challenge of those Chinese zookeepers is the challenge of our generation. We are the generation of Noah. We are actually, and particularly our kids, will be the first generation of human beings that will actually have to have strategies to save the last two, because we are actually going to meet the last two of more and more species. And as we do, there is a word that is going to have to disappear from the English language, and that word is later. Oh, when I grew up in Minnesota in the 50s and 60s, later, later was when I could swim the same lake, fish the same lake, walk the same valley, hey, even save the same endangered species. I could do it now, or I could do it later. Well, friends, in this hot, flat, and crowded world, later is officially over. So whatever you're going to save, please save it now, because this time, Later, will be too late. 
So those are five mega challenges in this hot, flat, and crowded world. Now there's two ways to look at a list like that. One is to look at that list and say, those are our challenges? Those are challenges? We're cooked. Let's party. Okay? There's no way we can rise to that. We are cooked. Let's party. Another way to look at that list is the way John Gardner of Common Cause described a list like that. He said, that, that, that list, that's a list of incredible opportunities masquerading as insoluble problems. That's how I look at that list. Incredible opportunities masquerading as insoluble problems. Why? Because what's really cool about that list, and it's what all of you are about, is that there's actually one solution for all five problems. That's right. There actually is one core solution to all five problems. Abundant, cheap, clean, reliable electrons. Whichever company, country, Community can actually come up with a source of abundant, cheap, clean, reliable electrons through innovation and efficiency, can actually dramatically reduce energy and natural resource supply and demand, undermine petro-dictatorship, mitigate climate change, relieve energy poverty, and I think dramatically slow biodiversity loss. How cool is that? The world's five big problems all have the same solution. Abundant, cheap, clean, reliable electrons. Well, what does that tell you? What it tells me is the next great global industry is going to be the search for abundant, cheap, clean, reliable electrons. I, I know that for, for sure. What I don't know is who's going to own that industry. Who's going to scale that industry? And I'm sure it's going to start in places like this community right here. Is it going to scale in this country? Is it going to scale in California? You're about to vote on a, on a Proposition 23. That would actually kill the very industry in California that will be part of the next great global industry. So really what I've been trying to help people understand and argue in my own column is that if those are the challenges, you have to think about energy much more broadly. It, it, it's about not just electric power, it's going to be about economic power, national power, innovation power, and moral power. The person who answers those questions. And that's why what I've been trying to do in my own work is to redefine green. Because the big problem in this country for 20 years, and last year was a terrible year for us, it came back in spades, is that the people who owned the definition of green were actually the people who hated it. I'm a big believer to name something is to own it. If you can name an issue, you can own the issue. And the people who named green in this country named it, were the people who hated it, and they named it liberal, tree-hugging, sissy, girly man, unpatriotic, vaguely European, vaguely European. <laughs> Mr. Gore, you're looking a little European to me now. Well, friends, I'm here to tell you that green, in light of those challenges and opportunities, green is geopolitical, geostrategic, geoeconomic, capitalistic, patriotic. Green is the new red, white, and blue. Oh, yes, it is. And don't let anybody tell you different. That's what it is, and that's why we need a green revolution. Now again, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Mr. Friedman, we're having a green revolution. I read about it in the Delta Sky Miles magazine. <laughs> oh, I love that when people tell me we're having a green revolution. I say, really? Us? Having a green revolution? Really? Have you ever been to a revolution where no one got hurt? Yeah, that's the green revolution we're having. In our green revolution, everybody's a winner. Sure. The oil companies are green. I read it on the op-ed page of the New York Times. I did in that little ad at the bottom of the page. BP's green. They told us they're beyond petroleum. GM's green. They finally got around to putting a little yellow cap on the flex fuel Hummer. Yeah. <laughs> We're all green. It's not a revolution, friends. That's a party. We're having a green party. And I have to tell you, it is so much fun. Because I get invited to all the parties. But it has no connection whatsoever with a revolution. 
I actually covered, I wrote a book about a real revolution. It was called the IT revolution, and the book was The World is Flat. That was a real revolution, because in that revolution, there was just one rule, change or die, change or die. There's a whole group of IT companies, DEC, Data General, they're not with us anymore. They're in that great IT heaven in the sky, because they did not change, and so they died. The rule of that revolution was not change your brand or die. Not somebody give me a green racing stripe from my stationery or die. No, it's change or die. You'll know the real green revolution is here when two things happen. Companies, institutions have to change or die. And you'll really know the green revolution has been won when the word green disappears. That is our goal. We want the word green to go the way of the phrase civil rights. One of the great achievements in this country is we made civil rights such a norm that we only talk about it when it's being violated. You want green to disappear. There'll be no such thing as a green building. There'll just be a building, and you will not be able to build it unless it's at the highest levels of energy efficiency and sustainability. Then there'll be such thing as a green car. There'll just be a car, and you won't be able to drive it unless it's at the highest levels of mileage, energy efficiency, and sustainability. That's our goal, friends, to make the word green disappear, get it out of the English language. Now, this issue of the Green Revolution, I have to admit, is a bit of a bugaboo of mine. And um, I've, uh, I've written about it a lot because I think it is one of the things that's really gotten us a little off track. And as I said, you know, when I was working on my book, people send me stuff all the time. And people, um, uh, you know, George and I get to play golf together occasionally. People know that I'm a golfer. And so somebody sent me this. Uh, a recent study found the average American golfer walks about 900 miles a year. Another study found American golfers drink, on average, 22 gallons of alcohol a year. That means that, on average, American golfers now get about 41 miles to the gallon. <laughs> kind of makes you proud to be an American, you know. So I was, uh, when I was working on the book, I was in my doctor's office one day, um, and I saw a magazine cover story caught my eye. It's not a magazine. I confess I usually read a working mother magazine. But the, Headline in the magazine caught my eye. It was called 205 Easy Ways to Save the Earth. I thought, so easy. I must Google for more. So I went home and I put into Google Easy Ways, Google, easy ways to Save the Earth, and this is a sample of the book and magazine titles that came up. Easy Ways to Protect Our Planet, Simple Ways to Save the Earth, 10 Ways to Save the Earth, 20 Quick and Easy Ways to Save the Planet, 5 Ways to Save the Earth, the 10 Easiest Ways You Can Green Your Home, 365 Ways to Save the Earth, 100 Ways You Can Save the Earth, 1,001 Ways to Save the Earth, 101 Ways to Heal the Earth, 10 Painless Ways to Save the Planet, 21 Ways to Save the Earth and Make More Money, 14 Easy Ways to Be an Everyday Environmentalist, Easy Ways to Go Green, 40 Easy Ways to Save the Planet, 10 Simple Ways to Save the Earth, Help Save the Planet, Easy Ways to Make a Difference, 50 Ways to Save the Earth, 50 Simple Ways to Save the Earth and Get Rich Trying. Top 10 ways to green up your sex life. V <laughs> vegan condoms and solar vibrators. I'm not making this up, OK? Uh, innovative ways to save planet Earth. 101 things designers can do to save the Earth. Five weird and wacky ways to save the Earth. Five ways to save the world. And for those, those with a messianic streak but who are short of both cash and time, 10 ways to save the Earth and money in under a minute. That, friends, is not a revolution. That's a party. So what would the real revolution look like? Well, it would look like a lot of things, and it would have many ingredients, but I want to focus on one, okay? Because I'm, I'm, a lot of people come to me and say, hey, uh, Friedman, what's your favorite fuel? Are you a wind guy? You a solar guy? You a wave guy? You a nuclear guy? You an algae guy? And I say to all of them, I'm none of these. I'm an ecosystem for innovation guy. This is a huge scale project. One of my teachers from Caltech, Nate Lewis, is here. And if I've learned one thing from Nate, this is about scale. If you don't have scale, you have a hobby. I like hobbies. I used to build model airplanes. I don't try to impact the climate as a hobby. So the only thing I believe that gives us scale is leveraging the market. If you cannot leverage the market, you cannot get scale. I'm not against Kyoto. I'm not against Copenhagen. 
although I was in Copenhagen, it was the worst conference I've ever been to in the world, bar none, okay? That goes for Arab-Israeli meetings, OPEC meetings. I've never seen anything like that, okay? Um, that's an aside. I'm not against it, though. Whoever can get 192 countries in the world to all agree on verifiable limits and reductions of their CO2 emissions, may God bless you and keep you. But you'll pardon me if I don't want to hostage my two daughters' future, not to mention my country, to the day we get 192 countries in the world to all agree on verifiable limits and reductions of their CO2 emissions. Pardon me, but I believe this is a problem that will be solved by innovators and engineers, not bureaucrats and regulators. That is my bias, that is my model. And therefore, what I'm looking for is how to unleash that ecosystem of innovation that will produce 10,000 green innovators in 10,000 green garages, trying 10,000 things, 1,000 of which will be promising, 100 of which will be way cool, and two of, my, two of which just might be the next green Google and green Microsoft, or green Apple, okay? That's really what I'm, what I'm focused on. I agree with, there are many other strategies. This is not exclusive. But if you don't have this one, I don't think you have a chance for a scale solution. If you take nothing else away from this talk this afternoon, folks, please take this essential lesson that I really have to credit my teacher, Nate, for teaching me. Okay. There is one fundamental difference between the IT revolution and what I call the ET revolution, the energy technology revolution, and it is vitally important. Price matters. I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. When gasoline was four and a half dollars a gallon, you could not buy a Toyota Prius at Coleman Toyota in Montgomery County, Maryland. The list got so long, they stopped taking names. When gasoline fell back to two dollars a gallon, you could not sell a Toyota hybrid Prius in Montgomery County, Maryland. Price matters because in the ET revolution, there is one fundamental difference with the IT revolution. The IT revolution gave us a whole new set of functions. I went from a typewriter to a laptop. I went from a telex to the internet. I went from carbon paper to a Xerox machine and then email. I would pay any amount of money to skip to each of those new technologies because I wasn't just getting cheaper. I was getting whole new functions. The great weakness of the ET revolution is that even when we win, even when we make the word green disappear, we're still just going to have the same light, same heating and cooling, and same mobility. You do not get a fundamentally new set of function. I think you get a much better planet, livable environment. All of that is huge. But you don't get new functions. And therefore, to get people to move from dirty fuel-powered systems to clean fuel-powered systems, price and a price signal is vital. If you don't have a price signal, you don't have a solution. Now, my favorite example, which Nate taught me, is imagine if I invented the world's first cell phone. Imagine I invented the world's first cell phone. And I came to President Hennessy here at Stanford, and a good friend, I said, John, I have a phone you can carry in your pocket. He'd say, Tom, a phone I can carry in my pocket so I can call Stanford donors 24-7, 365, <laughs> wherever they are? A phone I could carry in my pocket, that would change my life. I'll take 10. I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, President Hennessy. Wait, wait, wait a minute. This thing called a cell phone, these are expensive. They cost $1,000 each. He'd say, Tom, no problem. A phone I could carry in my pocket would change my life. I, I'll take 10. I sell 10 to him, 10 to her, 10 to him, 10 to you, 10 to her. You know what happens. You know what happens, I'm back six months later on the Stanford campus, my cell phone now weighs half the amount and only costs $500. Why? Because I'm down the cost volume learning curve heading for the Chindia price, the price at which my phone will scale in China and India. Remember, oil, coal, gas are commodities. The more demand you create for them, the more the price goes up. 
Wind, solar, cell phones, those are technologies. The more demand you create for a technology, the more they benefit from learning curves, the more the price goes down. I love Stanford. I come back a year later, call my friend John. Yo, President Hennessy, how's that phone working out for you? Oh, Tom, changed my life. My God, I've got donors on the line. They're backed up on call waiting. I got this call waiting thing now, you know. It's changed my life, gave me a whole new set of functions I never had before. Wonderful. Got another deal for you. Another deal, Tom? What's that? See the lights in your main meeting hall here? I'm going to power these lights with solar panels on the roof. But it is going to cost you $200 more a month. What would President Hennessy say? Tom, 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 Tom. You remember that cell phone you sold me? That changed my life, gave me a whole new set of functions I never had before. Tom, you were on the Stanford campus. Secretary Schultz hosted you, didn't you notice? We already have light. And we really don't care where the photons and electrons come from. So unless Governor Schwarzenegger comes along and says, yo, President Hennessy, from now on, you're actually going to pay the fully burdened cost of those lights. You're going to pay the cost of the troops protecting the oil from the Persian Gulf. You're going to pay the cost of cleaning up the carbon molecules in the atmosphere. They're now going to cost you $300 a month. Oh, when that happens, when that happens, President Hennessy, he gets on his cell phone, which now just clips to his ear and costs $25, and says, Tom, your solar lights, I'll take 10. And then what, friends? Then I'm down the cost volume learning curve heading for the China-India price. Without a price signal, nothing changes at scale. Don't let anyone tell you the opposite. With all due respect to President Obama, who keeps telling me he visited a battery factory, but that's great, and then he visited a wind farm, you know, and then he visited the solar factory, but on, 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 on a gasoline tax or a carbon tax, sorry. Missing in action. My political advisors say I can't mention it. Well, you know what that is? I'll tell you what that is. Bob Lutz, the former vice chairman of General Motors, not a man I'm often given to quoting, he nailed this one. When Congress basically came to GM and said, thou shalt make smaller cars, Bob Lutz said, I see, let me get this right now. We're supposed to make smaller cars by your order, but you're not going to impose a tax that will create the consumer sustained pull to buy those cars. That's like ordering every shirt maker in America to make only size smalls and thinking that you can do that and never ask anyone to go on a diet. That's what we're doing. We're telling everyone in America, buy a size small. But diet? No. Eat all the energy you want. Well, how many size smalls do you think we're going to sell? Don't tell me you visited a battery factory. Don't tell me you went to the umpteenth wind farm and had a photo op. Go up to the Congress and sell them on a carbon tax. To all the students here, this is what it's about, kids, OK? I have to tell you something very frank. The big oil companies, they're not on Facebook. They're in your face. The big oil companies, Peabody Coal, the Southern Company, trust me, they don't have a chat room. They're in the cloakroom where the rules get written and the money changes hands. So you want to make a difference? Don't tell me you blogged about it. Don't tell me you posted a column on your Facebook page. You need to get out of Facebook and into somebody's face. Because your life may be digital, but trust me on this one, I am kind of an old fart, but I do know this. Politics in this country is still analog. And the people who know that best are the fossil fuel companies. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, my motto has always been change your leaders, not your light bulbs. Because leaders write rules, rules shape markets, markets give you scale. I thought we tried that. It hasn't worked so far. Let me just go to the next slide. Actually, this is my favorite quote in the book. It's uh, uh, from a friend of mine, Dan Nolan. When we leave Iraq, it'll be the biggest transfer of air conditioners ever known to mankind. Um, Dan headed the US Army Energy Task Force. Let me skip ahead to the last chapter. So I was doing a dialogue with Jeff Immelt, the head of GE, a few 
years ago when I was working on the book, and at one point Jeff said, you know, Tom, if only, if only we had a president who would just impose that ecosystem of innovation, the right rules, standards, taxes, and regulations, everyone in that American innovation ecosystem would complain for a month, and then trust me, everyone would adapt, and the whole thing would just explode. And I thought about that, and I called him the next day, and I said, Jeff, what you're really saying is if only we could be China for a day. So the penultimate chapter of this book is called China for a Day, but not for two. And it's my crazy fantasy, born of utter frustration, that somehow for one day we could actually do the right thing and put in place the right ecosystem for innovation. But I quickly got over that, and that leads to the last chapter of the book. I really love going to China, love the Chinese people, but don't want their system of government for even a day. That I don't envy at all. But what I do want is my own government to work democratically with the same focus, authority, legitimacy, and stick to itiveness to do big things again democratically the way China does it through top down command and control means. And that leads to the last chapter of the book, which is called A Democratic China or a Banana Republic, because I think that is our choice. Oh, oh, I'm not talking about the Latin American kind of banana republic. No, in the utility industry, the men and women in that industry, they use the acronym banana, you know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. They use banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything banana. When it comes to clean power, we're either going to get our democracy to work and be able to do big things again, big aspirational things, or when it comes to clean tech, Renewable power, the regeneration, we're going to be a banana republic and build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. Now, I don't want to leave you on a pessimistic note. They say pessimists are usually right, optimists are usually wrong, but I believe all the great change in history was done by optimists. A few years ago, I was in Israel. My column um, runs in Hebrew in the Haaretz newspaper. Great thrill for me that I have my column translated there twice a week, and I was having dinner at the editor of Haaretz's home, and he said, I said to him, you know, why do you guys run my column? And he said, Tom, you're the only optimist we have. And <laughs> there was an Israeli general at the dinner, Uzi Dayan, and um, we were walking to the dinner table. I wrote a column about this, and... Uzi said to me, Tom, I know why you're an optimist. I said, really, why? He said, it's because you're short. I said, short? He said, yeah, you can only see that part of the glass that's half full, okay? <laughs> so, uh, truth is, I'm not that short, you know. Um, uh, but I am an optimist, and I will go down swinging uh, as an optimist. I, I believe in the huge potential of that thrust we have coming from below in this country. What I love about America is that there's always somebody who doesn't get the word. There's always somebody out there who, despite all the obstacles, goes out into their garage and invents something amazing. I still believe that. I still believe that. So let me end by just reading you half a page. It's the last page of the book. It's no way to end a book or a talk. It's actually, uh, it's actually an obituary. Um, it was an obituary for Dana Meadows, one of the great environmental teachers in America, taught at Dartmouth, who died in February of 2001. And there was a memorial service for her on February 21st, 2001. And um, Amory Lovins, the great founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute, delivered this eulogy. A biologist, perhaps E.O. Wilson, noted that bees, ants, and termites, though not very smart individually, display high intelligence collectively. And then he added, people seem just the opposite. Dana Meadows was an exception. She was one of those promising specimens that are turning up more and more often in the search for intelligent life on Earth, one of those much higher primates whose love, logic, radical stubbornness, courage, and passion awaken the rest of us to our ability and our responsibility to save the world. She wrote three years ago, by nature I'm an optimist, to me all glasses are half full. Yet she didn't shrink from reporting bad news, always blended with encouragement. She treated the future as choice, not fate. 
as choice, not fate. And she defined with luminous clarity how to do as one sometimes must what is necessary. She shared Rene Dubois' view that despair is a sin. So when asked if we have enough time to prevent catastrophe, she would always say, we have exactly enough time starting now. Two years ago, when emailing an unusually somber column about events that made her weep, she added the following note as counterpoint. A CEO was having to babysit for his young daughter. He was trying to read the paper, but was totally frustrated by the constant interruptions. When he came across a full page picture of the NASA photo of the Earth from space, he got a brilliant idea. He tore the picture up into small pieces and told his child to try to put it back together. He then settled in for what he expected to be a good half hour of peace and quiet. But only a few minutes went by before his daughter peered at his side with a big grin on her face. You're finished already? He asked. Yes, she replied. How did you do it? Well, I saw there was a picture of a person on the other side. So when I put the person together, the earth got put together too. There is so much for me to admire in that eulogy. The conviction that the future is our choice, not our fate. That when you put people together, you put the planet together. And that there is nothing in the universe quite as powerful as six billion minds wrapping around one problem. But most of all, the best expression of sober optimism I've ever heard, we have exactly enough time starting now. Friends, we really are at a serious moment. We need to get back to work on our country and on our planet. The time couldn't be shorter. The stakes couldn't be higher. The payoff, though, couldn't be greater. And we have exactly enough time starting now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions, so. Yep, so uh, questions. Uh, again, uh, please uh, get a microphone and uh, raise your hand and we'll take questions. Okay, how about right up here to start? This is not a setup. <laughs> I rarely get to interview another New York Times person, uh, Andy, Andy Revkin. Um, did, did the environmental groups really screw up in the sense of trying to push for a comprehensive climate bill? It just says the, the climate treaty, same thing, clim comprehensiveness in a world of complexity. Were those things so unattainable that now trying to get a modest carbon price will be much har harder? It's a really good question, Andy. Uh, next question, please. Um. <laughs> No, it's a really good question. Um, you know, I don't, I'm sure, well, I know what I believe that it had to be made simple, you know, and there's no question the House climate bill became so complicated, no one could understand it. There were so many side deals, cut deals, over deals, and you know, I'm really a big believer that if people really listen through their stomachs, not their ears. So if you connect with them on a gut level, um, they actually don't care about the details. If you don't connect with them on a gut level, you can't show them enough details. And I think one of the problems happened to all of us, I don't want to blame the environmental groups, um, is that we kind of lost the gut connection for people of what this was about. Um, you know, you can blame the environmental groups all you want, but I think we both know, Andy, the fossil fuel industry poured huge buckets of money um, into blocking this legislation in the end. And then we faced a global movement to completely pollute the science around climate change. If I'm tossing out a little blame, uh, I have a lot of frustration in me toward the Obama administration. Climate change became a four-letter word on their watch. And um, when you own the bully pulpit and people um, who are really peddling bogus stuff can delegitimize one of your central pillars, something's gone wrong there. I, I'll say this here because I said it on Meet the Press. I don't understand. Obama had the A team on environment. Steve Chu, Nobel Prize winner. John Holdren, head of the American Academy of Science climate expert. 
Sheila Jackson, amazing woman running EPA. Carol Browner, White House Energy, is our former EPA chief. They're endangered species I've seen in the last year, more than the four of them. They've been in a witness protection program. And I don't know what that was about, but all I know is the field was left wide open. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of blame to go around, but, and the environmental community has part of it. But they were up against some really dirty players. And so I'm, I'm a little reluctant to heap this on, on, on them. I'm sure all of us would go back and say, how do we do this wrong? But there, there, are, you know, uh, there are a lot of hands on this dagger. What really worries me is we're not going to get an energy bill this year. Certainly not going to get anything on climate. Um, if the uh, House um, tilts toward the Republicans, it's not clear we're going to get an energy bill next year or the year after. We may go three years without an energy bill. What I think is the core thing ailing our country today, uh, I think can be illustrated with one example. It's that, it's that uh, space shuttle. So I was just in Tianjin, China, at the World Economic Forum, and I met a guy named Mike Biddle, uh, who uh, event started a company called MBA Polymers. And um, MBA Polymers designed a series of credibly innovative processes to take any pile of junk, put it through their black box, although it's a huge process, and out comes five forms in different colors of plastic, exactly in the form the plastic industry needs to recycle. Uh, not only does it work, he's already done 100 million tons of recycling, but last Sunday, MBA Polymers started in Richmond, California by Mike Biddle, whose entire startup was funded with federal research grants from the Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, and NIST. Last Sunday was named by The Economist as the most innovative energy environment company in the world in 2010. That's our guy. Really good. Our guy won that. And you know why I met him in China? Because he has 25 employees in California and 250 in China, the UK, and Europe for a very simple reason. Mike Biddle does what he calls above ground mining. He looks at a pile of junk, and for him, that's a gold mine. And both EU and China have passed a law that says anything with a cord or battery in it has to be recycled at the cost of the manufacturer. So they produce huge above ground mines for his process to work at scale. We don't have such a law in this country. We recycle Coke and Pepsi bottles, okay? We actually ship a lot of our junk by boat to China. That's what we do, what we don't just put into huge city dumps and landfills. We don't have that law. So Mike Biddle, with his little startup, was able to afford to hire one K Street lobbyist to try to lobby in the energy bill for this law that China will have next year that the EU has today. Unfortunately, there was no energy bill. So here we have this incredible innovative prowess. That's us. Innovation is us exploding right down the road in Richmond, California. But it's not scaling here. It's not going to scale here. It's going to scale in Europe and China. And that, frankly, folks, if you know anything about the history of the solar and wind industry, that is the history of American innovation on clean tech. We basically invented the entire industry and it's scaling somewhere else because the booster rocket is not putting in place the enabling legislation to take us to scale. That's the problem. And unless we find a fix for that problem, we're going to stay on this very slow, incremental, the worst kind of decline, an incremental decline where you never get serious enough until it's too late. So that's, we got to be serious about that problem. Please. Sure. I'm John Chin. Uh, thank you first for uh, a really good job of, I think, revealing the challenges that are in front of thank us you. and the need for change. It's very clear. Uh, 
I'd like to, you know, reflect upon a question that came up uh, yesterday in, in this session, which was, why can't we do a better job of telling the good side and encouraging uh, the people that are going to make the change? Because it's you people that are sitting in this room that are going to make the changes that are going to change the world. And certainly with the intelligence and the innovation and the capability, and also this, this group that's so well known for taking innovative ideas and turning them into new businesses that really work. This community is very well known for that. So I'd like to invite you to think a little bit more about, uh, you know, what are the examples that are out there that are very encouraging. There are encouraging signals out there that I see. I see a world that 20 years ago didn't think carbon was even something it wanted to think about. And now I see a world that actually has some form of a regulatory system that puts a price on carbon mm -hmm. in the world. Whatever you, you like or don't like about carbon trading or clean development mechanism, at least they're beginning. There is a sign of something that's being tried in the world that puts a price signal out there, and then we can get experience and fix it and make it work better. Uh, you're getting discussions of regulations like this. So the it's encouraging good, signals. I got a, a really good question. I'd simply say that. Um, um, looked at from 30,000 feet, and maybe, you know, the distance of time, you can say this, this whole thing has a positive slope to it. And that may be true. But there is a speed and scale issue here. And I think that's really the problem. I have no doubt eventually we'll get there. Um, but, I mean, I think there's so many experts in this room, no more than me. We already may be too late. You know, so... That's what, that's what really worries me. And, and I, I would agree with you. I think when I grew up and where we are now, you know, complete change. Um, and, and the reason, though, I really believe it's so important that we get it right is that I really believe um, the most powerful model for social change in the world is emulation. And if we go green, America, it's like no other country going green. And if we go green, I think it scales like wildfire. Um, by us not going green, others are going to do it anyways. China's got to do it out of necessity and a sense of opportunity, India as well, Brazil. But it won't scale at the speed and scope we need. And that's why I've been focusing all my energy here. Uh, it's really all I can say, but I think you raised a really good point. Hi, Tom. Hi. Uh, Mike Murphy from the Woods Institute for the Environment here at Stanford. Uh, great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Hypothetical situation. Maybe if we can jump in our time machine and uh, transport ourselves to the University of Oklahoma and a similar meeting, but it's hosted by Senator James Inhofe. Mm -hmm. Just wondering, how do you think uh, the same talk would go over to uh, an audience there in Oklahoma? And would you change anything uh, from your talk today to the folks there at uh, University of Oklahoma? That's a really good question. Um, and in fact, I gave this lecture in Tulsa to a basically oil and gas energy group uh, uh, in the first week of my book tour. That wasn't an accident. Um, I am a really, well, first of all, I'd say two things. This is a scale problem. If you do not have political scale behind it, you do not have a solution. You have a hobby. So what I really try to do in all my talks, and I really pride myself on this, if I can't sell this in Oklahoma, I got nothing. If I can only sell this in small liberal East Coast colleges or Stanford, I don't have a solution, I have a hobby. So the first thing I would say is I openly, proudly, and avowedly speak out of two sides of my mouth. Okay? To um, uh, conservatives in Oklahoma, I say I have a plan to make America stronger, winning the next great industrial revolution. Oh, and all the stuff Al Gore talks about, we're going to get that as a byproduct. When I come to Stanford, I say, I have a plan to make America greener. And all that stuff Dick Cheney's worried about, we're going to get that as a byproduct. OK, so um, I'm not lying to anybody. I happen to believe both. But it's how you frame it. So that's one way I do it. But I really pride myself in going into the lion's. Remember, I spent most of my life, I'm a little Jewish kid from Minneapolis. I spent 25 years covering the Arab-Israeli conflict in the heart of the Arab world. And if you read my stuff, you know I'm not, you're all wonderful, you're all great, I love you, everybody's wonderful here, it's all Israel's fault. 
That ain't my thing, you know. And so what I really learned is the most important lesson of life is being a good listener. That if you actually listen to people, even in the fossil fuel industry, and show them that you're listening to them. These aren't bad people. They're doing something for a living. And by the way, those fuels powered our growth and gave us this university. You got to listen to people. You can't just come in and say, you're bad, you're evil. You, know? you do have to listen to people. It doesn't mean you have to agree. But if you actually listen to people, I don't mean just waiting for them to stop talking, but actually listen to what they have to say. It's a, because you have to understand there's two things about listening. One is what you learn, and the second, much more important thing, listening is a sign of respect. And if you listen to people, and they sense you're respecting them, you can actually tell them their ears really open up. I learned that in the Arab-Israeli conflict. If they sense you aren't listening to them, by the way, they can smell it from 100 paces, you can't tell them the sun is shining. Okay. So, that is maybe one of the failings we've had a, a, a little bit. There, there was a little moral superiority, you know, in the green movement there, you know, for a while. There's also a bit of apocalypse, which is, you're basically going to die. You're dead. You're going to die. But um, I'll talk to you anyways. But we're basically dead. And I don't think that's, like, really a way to get people out of their chair, on their feet, you know, excited about doing something. So that's another tactical, you know, approach I have. But most of all, you've got to learn how to use the language to your advantage and not be afraid to use it. So I actually do this dialogue in the book. Um, I, uh, I imagine, you know, we got 535 members of the Senate and, and the House. How could it be, I mean, just think about it, that not a single one, not one, will come out in support of a gasoline tax which is not win-win, it's win, 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 win. Cleans our air, drives our innovation, strengthens the dollar, takes money away from petrodictators. And we don't have one person. You'd think somebody would say, what the heck, I'm gonna lose, I'll take a flyer. Gasoline tax, you know. Not one. So in the book I do, I say, I'm imagining um, that I'm running uh, uh, for the Congress, and I'm running against a guy who's opposed to any taxes. And what's your name, if I could ask? Michael. And let's say you're my opponent, Michael. How would I deal with this issue? Well, we're on the debate up there, and Michael starts the debate by saying, there's my opponent, Mr. Friedman. Never seen a tax he doesn't like. Now get this, folks. In the middle of the recession, he wants a dollar a gallon gasoline tax. Ha, 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 I get that. What would I say? I'd say... Mike, let's get one thing straight. We're both for a tax. Because if you don't think your oil price being set by the world's biggest cartel isn't a tax, then you're not paying attention. The difference between you and me is about where our tax dollars go. You see, I like my tax dollars to go to build American schools, American universities, American roads, American research, America's future, and you seem to be indifferent to that and want our tax dollars to go to build the Saudi future, the Iranian infrastructure, and the Libyan highway system. So let's get one thing straight. We're both for a tax. It's just a little tick I have. I like my taxes to build my country, okay? Now, if you can't win that debate, you don't belong in politics. How could nobody, not a single person, dare to make that argument? And that's, where was Obama with that? Where was Obama with that? People come out against the gasoline tax, the carbon tax, you say, oh, you guys, yeah, I, I know, you, you guys are conservatives for OPEC. I know you guys, you know. Put them on the defensive a little bit. But nobody does that. Oh, don't ruffle any. The political advisors say, don't use tax. I talked to a very senior White House advisor after they passed the health bill. And we were waiting for the energy bill. I said, are you going to do it now? Very senior advisor. And he pulled me aside and said, Tom, I got to tell you, our side has legislative fatigue. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry to hear that. You've only been out of power for eight years, and you have legislative fatigue? Believe me, the other guys aren't tired at all, and you're going to get a long vacation come November. 
So how hard are we really trying? Sorry, that's about people who love their chair and love their party more than they love their country. That's what it's about. As long as that's the case, we're really stuck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.